I'm Cal Keith Perry of the Image of Fish and Theopoetics.net, and this, I believe, is Daniel Meter. Is that what I said right? Right. Beautiful. Um, and uh, we're here today to talk about this book, uh, "Why Be a Christian?" Open parentheses if no one goes to hell. Um, and I wonder if before we got into the the kind of meat uh, of some of that, Daniel, you could tell folks kind of about your context and what prompted you to write a book uh, <laughs> titled that. I've been a pastor my whole working life. Uh, I had planned to be a professor, got my PhD, uh, never worked out, never landed a job. I discovered that I love being a pastor um, about halfway through. So after being in the ministry 15 years, I decided to stay. I decided to be a pastor. Uh, immigrant churches typically, or a very urban church in Hoboken, a small urban church in Hoboken, with a lot of newcomers to the faith, or uh, what I would call post post-Christian. <laughs> Double okay. post. Double post-Christian or even post-Buddhist. I mean, they've done the, they tried the whole Buddhist thing, right? So, <laughs> um, and then here in Brooklyn, my context is very much uh, people who are, um, yeah, the, all the old jokes about I'm into spirituality but not into organized religion. So we, all, we offer disorganized religion. <laughs> um, <laughs> the church is disorganized religion. Um, but I love the scriptures, but I grew up in a very warm, uh, traditional Orthodox Reformed home, but very warm. My father was a pastor in a black church in Bedford Stuyvesant. So very solid, traditional faith, but, uh, but yet with a very open atmosphere. So I never felt, um, I never felt nervous about exploring, exploring mm -hmm. theology. And my father always encouraged that, even though we had a very deeply rooted Reformed faith. Already by college, I began to doubt eternal damnation. I don't know whether it was starting with the last battle of Lewis, C.S. Lewis, or um, <laughs> I don't know where it was from, but I write in my book about early childhood, mm -hmm. early childhood experiences about not liking the idea of eternal life, and also that picture of the New Jerusalem coming down on, on earth. So some of that Dutch Calvinist Kingdom of God stuff like Ritterboss. I don't know if you people have ever heard of Ritterboss, some of those people that actually predated N.T. Wright, some of that Dutch Calvinist Kingdom of God stuff that was mediated for children through some Dutch children's story Bibles. <laughs> so uh, I, I remember reading, uh, was it John or Gordon Wenham? One of the Wenham brothers, a book on the goodness of God in which he outlined four different eschatologies. Mm -hmm. and I think it was John. Yeah. John Wenham. And one of the ones, it was an university uh, varsity press book I read in the 70s, I guess. And he laid out annihilationism, annihilationism, even though I don't think that's a good way to describe it. But um, And I realized with a friend, oh, I, I accept that. that. That's how I accept that. So that was before I went to seminary. And could you, and could you just lay out what, what your understanding of annihilism is, uh, pretending that Annihilationism that. Is, is that um, <clears throat> the unsaved when they die are annihilated. They, they're, they're destroyed body and soul. They do not live on forever in some eternal punishment. There's no eternal bad life. Mm -hmm. I, th I think the traditional Augustinian Christian view, the conventional views, is that there's two kinds of life. There's eternal good life and eternal bad life. Mm -hmm. And when we say eternal life, what we're saying is eternal good life. Uh, but yet, even the damned or the unsaved have eternal life, even though it's a lousy life in the conventional right. Right. And I never bought so annihilationism says the uh, all those who are uh, unsaved die die once and for all they don't exist forever. In so, so now you're pastoring a church you have been for quite some number of years and you still have this uh, kind of personal predilection to kind of question this eternality of of damnation at least right. kind of metaphysically speaking like there's a place that is hell you have that's the issue predominantly right um, well, so, two, yeah that's one of the issues okay and what's the other ones then <laughs> that we're naturally immortal that mm. in other words that we have this immortal soul that has to go somewhere mm. and so it's not only so it's a, it's a complex of three issues first that we spend eternity in heaven Mm -hmm. That we that it's our that we have this immortal soul that has to go somewhere, and uh, and that uh, that the unsaved have in immor immortality in hell. I think the belief that we go off to heaven, whether only in the soul or body and soul, is also a problem. Now, 
Um, one of the things that um, is, I think, immediately appear uh, clear to readers is its accessibility. That even though you clearly come off as someone who's learned and knows his stuff, you're, you're not writing for uh, PhDs, right? You'd agree with that. I that's that was my aim. Um, I'm glad if I'm successful. Now, so the other thing that I thought was interesting is the way that you set up. Um, the, the chapters as it, it almost feels to me as if there are a series of conversations that you'd have with someone that right. so like, I can imagine pastorally knowing your context you say a little bit about it in the kind of preface or introduction right. I can imagine each one of those chapters as conversations you've had with folks uh, as you say on your avenue is that is that right, right. I think that's that's exactly right that's yeah. exactly right. Um, and, and I guess a question would be um, what would be your hope for for this book, I mean, that whose hands do you hope it falls into, and and what do they do with it? Do they read it cover to cover? Do they bring it to to a small group and process it? Do they pray over it. What what's your hope for who gets dream, this and how they use it? Had I been able, my dream, had I been able to find a uh, paperback publisher, a mass market paperback, but and I couldn't find one. No one would do it. Was a uh, sort of um, an airplane bookstore, an airport bookstore book that people would use like consumer reports. That was my dream. <laughs> uh, that you oh um, you oh 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 this model is so, something like that. Yeah, a book for lighter reading, very introductory, a shopping book. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. You're you're shopping for something. Mm -hmm. So that's that was my goal. My experience is that people do want theology. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I believe that pastors should be competent theologians. I, I think. Amen. I agree. I believe that a local pastor is expected to honor the population out on the avenue with being a consulting local theologian. People ask theological questions, perhaps not in typical typical theological ways, but they're asking theological questions right. all the time. Yeah. And, and I hope, my goal is to be an accessible local theologian. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to... Um kind of see if you have the, the elevator pitch version or the kind of reader's digest version of, of the answer to the question that's the book why be a Christian if no one goes to hell there's a good God who's doing something good in the world and you can be part of what God is doing for your own good and I and it, and it strikes me that one that kind of answer is pr profoundly pragmatic and interpersonal it is <laughs> and that's been a criticism. That's been a criticism, say, of Andrew Perman, hmm. who found who finds me too individualistic hmm. and not um, communal enough in my book. Right. Well, and I mean, I guess that's the, the question: is if something is doctrinally correct, but it doesn't work in the pews, like how valuable is it? Um, and and then vice, but not that those are mutually exclusive categories by any means. But but what are we what are we after? And and the, our ought not our method reflect that, right? And I would want to begin with God is doing something in the world, or God, there, there's a good, I want to begin with what God is doing in the world. So, um, just to be particular, just because I think sometimes folks are interested in this kind of thing, um, what's your response to um, some of the, the scriptures, um, whether they're in the New Testament, and they're kind of um, referring to the kind of uh, pit of fire kind of style, or the Old Testament where we have a different version of hell being per late. You know, what do you do in the book to kind of address some of those things? In the, I think it's the third chapter, I very, in a very cursory way, and, I've, and that might be a weakness of the book, that I was not more deliberate about it. I summarize what's behind the word hell, the two words behind the word hell in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, hell represents two different Greek words, which are combined into the conventional view. And in the book, I try to summarize what <clears throat> what Hades means yeah. um, by the New Testament and what Gehenna means by the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And uh, when understood in, in their action, without the English translation and convergence into hell, what they actually meant in New Testament terms, then the, then the conventional view of hell begins to fall apart when you mm -hmm. see what Jesus meant by Gehenna and what the New Testament meant by Hades. The heart of your argument uh, is based on your kind of uh, intellectual and cognitive understanding and kind of uh, interpretation of the text. You don't feel like you need anything beyond what's in Scripture to get to where you're at. Exactly. And, right. and 
Some people don't like that because it doesn't feel religious enough. It it feels too secular. <laughs> but, uh, I'm I think God has. Uh, it's it's a rather boring approach to to revelation. You know, <laughs> you got to do your Greek and you got to do your Hebrew, and yeah. that's yeah. which I think is maybe why pastors don't want to work that hard. I don't know. <laughs> well, the the last thing um, then maybe would be. Um, so why be a Christian if no one goes to hell? And I'll ask the comparable sister question. Um, why be a Christian if I don't get to go to heaven? Question mark. Do I get to go to heaven? The answer is no, but you get to be with Jesus. You get to, you get to share eternal life with the Lord Jesus and the life of the world to come. You, uh, you get to follow, you get to follow Jesus into the promised land if mm -hmm. you, if you would like to. Right. If you would like to follow Jesus into the promised land of the new heaven and new earth, you're welcome to. And so that's a transfiguring kind of way of being in the world then. That's right. Uh, in the new heaven and in, in the life of the world to come, I, I believe there's a, real there's a real future beyond the boundary of this existence, which, uh, like the old gospel songs, the Jordan River, death is like the Jordan, and you get through that, and there's a real life on the other side. I really do believe in eternal life on the other side, in the life of the world to come. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think that that it's as much for this life as it is for them. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think Paul is very clear. If we don't believe in the resurrection and the new, the the, the resurrected life of the individual believers in whatever mystery that is, then we are the most miserable of people today. And mm -hmm. and uh, I, I I I take seriously what he says there. So why be a Christian? It's to live, it's to begin our eternal life right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's to begin life, the life of the world to come right now. And yeah. that, I, and it makes a difference in how I deal with people who have done me wrong. It makes a difference with people. It makes a difference in how I vote. It makes a difference in how I treat the, my landscape. It makes a difference in, in my associations. That I'm already living in that life now, and and I live by a different kind of economic rules. I don't live by the economic rules of scarcity. I don't live by the economic rules of Adam Smith. I don't, you know, it makes a difference in how we live now. Right. Good. Well, uh, I appreciate it. Um, this will kind of stay in my pocket as a tool for folks. I honestly do think that, uh, not that you need to listen to what I think about it, but I actually think that this is a great book and you may want to consider um, talking about it uh, as, a, as a church kind of uh, chapter by chapter study guide. I think... Yeah. I think oh, there's a lot. There. What, yeah, whether oh. people agree with it or not, I think that the context of each chapter is such that it was ripe for conversation and dialogue, and that helps people really explore what they understand the church to be and how Christ is kind of moving in their lives. So I, I tend to hold on to this and make use of it, kind of in congregational settings, because I think it's it's full of potential for for folks to really dig into some of this stuff. Why? Well, thank you very much. I Absolutely. will do that. Great. I will do that. Um, Thanks so much for taking time on a very busy afternoon. Yes. And thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your service to all those folks out there.